On January the 6th, 2005, an incident involving a freight train carrying 100 tons of chlorine was going to change the flourishing town of Graniteville forever. This small town in South Carolina, USA, was not equipped to deal with such a huge incident. The Graniteville Fire Department was overwhelmed, consisting of 45 volunteer firefighters who all have other jobs as well on top of their services to the community. It was really a terrible situation that, that like I said, I hope and pray that no one else or no other community has to go through. It took a toll in more than just lives. It, it, it killed the, the industry. I mean, you gotta realize a whole town and a fire department was decimated when that impact, when those trains impacted. The railway crew had forgotten a switch in the wrong position when they left their shift the night before. The target's wrong! The train derailed at approximately 2.39 a.m., exposing the center of Graniteville to 80 tons of some of the deadliest chemical substances known to man. Uh, what was emergency? I think there's been a train wreck. I went to the end of the building, I see smoke. I can't see anything. Oh, God, I smell smoke! I thought there was a train wreck. I think there's been a train wreck. Okay, ma'am, we'll have to get out of here. I got a wreck! I rolled down the window and this gentleman told me, he says, uh, we've had a a head-on collision with the train. We got a chemical leak, I can't breathe. And then he fell to the ground. And it was just like it hit me. The Graniteville train derailment is North America's most devastating hazmat accident to this day. Perhaps not since the World War II have the devastating effects of chlorine on the human organism been seen so clearly. People just can't imagine what this derailment brought upon us as far as Expect the unexpected. So this is something that wasn't over overnight and, and still goes on. At the end of the day, it could have been of a magnitude of a hundred worse than what we saw in this event. For the amount of chlorine that we turned loose here in this community. Uh, if it happened in the middle of the day, we had schoolhouses that would have been occupied with, with young children. That hour of the morning, there was yeah, very few, there's very little traffic, only night shifts working at some of the plants, and in a way it, it lessened the amount of people who were exposed. But yeah, just the, the luck of timing. The first person on the accident scene was Chief Phil Napier, head of the Graniteville Volunteer Fire Department. Without any information about the chemical leak, Phil went straight from his home to the scene, thinking he was about to lead a simple rescue operation. So uh, I told everybody just clear the area. I guess I'd be the one to go in and try to determine where it was and what it was. And still not knowing that there's a chemical leak. And uh, so I proceeded on down Marshall Street that came up upon the railroad and I turned right to head toward the fire station. And I saw a gentleman standing and a gentleman laying on railroad track. And I stopped and rolled down the window and this gentleman told me, he says, we've had a head-on collision with the train, we've got a chemical leak, I can't breathe. And he immediately fell to the ground. And it was just like I took in a breath, like of ammonia or something, and, and it was just like it froze. I uh, heard the chief come on with a little bit of panic in his voice going, I can't breathe, I've got to leave the area, can't do anything for these two people. And that was the last we heard of the chief for uh, probably five, six minutes. With the fire chief out of commission, Assistant Chief Grady Friday now had to make a difficult call. Seeing what had happened to Chief Napier, he decided that none of his firefighters would enter the area until help had arrived. A reverse 911 call was then initiated, alerting the community to stay in their homes with windows and doors closed. And so in the beginning, the decision was made to shelter in place. Now, my assistant chief and Captain Bakley made that decision when I was uh, within that time frame, I was lost. There's no memory. They had no radio contact with me. They didn't know where I was a fatality or what until I, like I said, basically got out of the area. The fire chief, Phil Napier, eventually regained his consciousness and managed to call in a hazmat team from nearby Savannah Riverside. 
I immediately started calling for mutual aid for hazmat teams, and I told them we we're going to have to have a major evacuation. Hazmat experts Ed Schuler and Greg Bailey, who both had plenty of experience from past serious incidents, then went in to lead a recce of the area. My partner, uh, Greg Bailey, and I were on the initial hazmat recon team, and I led that team in to find out exactly what the wreck entailed. We didn't know exactly what chemicals were involved. And we had walked a long distance in protective equipment down to ground zero. And the fog was so thick. And all of a sudden, you know, the, the red crossing lights flashed in front of me. It just, you know, so bright through the fog. It was basically overwhelming. Um, to come upon a hazmat scene like that, to see all those rail cars just thrown all over the place. And we looked to the right of what the wreckage was, and there was a there was a, a live oak tree there, and underneath it we noticed it was the silhouette of a car. We could see its taillights. So I told my partner that I was going to go over and check it out, and I went over and I beat on the climbed through the limbs and I beat on the glass, and uh, that's when uh, Mark Broom, the victim, started screaming for help. Uh, you could tell he was in respiratory distress. Um, he had been in there for a couple of hours. We immediately radioed in that we had a survivor here. Uh, we knew not to open the doors or anything because we were able to kill the guy. Uh, we called in for help, told him we needed transportation out of here. And uh, a little while later, uh, the SRS hazmat team showed up in a pickup truck and uh, they retrieved the guy out of the vehicle and, and left. We continued to do our recon, that was our job, to, to find out what was going on here. We were calling in the car numbers, we noticed uh, something we thought was a chemical fire, but it turned out it was something else. Uh, there was white powder all over the ground, uh, and in the middle of all this stuff, and you couldn't hardly see your hand in front of your face, it's so thick, a car pulls up. A lady opens the door and asks us what's going on, we told her, ma'am, you need to get the hell out of here. You know, and finally ran her off. We continued to do our recon. Uh, we're calling the numbers in, and Ed backs up, and he falls. And he's got this white powder on him, which we didn't know what it was at the time. And so we kind of dust him off, do a little bit more recon, and then our low air alarm goes off. Vibe alerts on the uh, Scots went off, and signal us was out of air. And so it's going to be a long trek out anywhere to get in the cloud. So we went uphill. Uh, so let's go up. So I know the area. We'll go up to Pole Boys. That's going to be up above the cloud. So we went up the hill and got out of the cloud. And about time we exhausted our air, they finally came in with a pickup truck and they carried us out of here. Many people at that point had then started to clear the hot zone on their own initiative. In hindsight, this may have been what saved many of them from death or serious injury. Because although they had been told to stay in their homes, the resources from the fire department and the hazmat team would not have been enough to carry out a full-scale evacuation in time. At that time, I kind of like panicked, and I started running down the road and started running to different people's houses that I know didn't have transportation. And I didn't even have my face covered up, to be honest with you. The, my goal was to try to get as many of the kids and the elderly that, out that I could. So I went to one of my neighbor's house. She has seven kids, seven of them. And um, I was like, do you have a way out? And she was like, no. I said, well, come on. We're going to you know, cram up in my car, walked around trying to find other people that needed a ride. Even though we had 12 people in the car, we was going to get more people that we could. We even had to put them in a the trunk. It didn't even matter, as long as they were out safely. That was the goal. As people came out of the hot zone, they had to be decontaminated from the exposure and the smell of chlorine gas. So decon stations were set up in various locations, especially near the hospitals, because the hospitals would not accept people until they had been deconned. All I could do was tell them to go to the hospital. See, not knowing the hospital wasn't going to accept them because they had to be deconned. They didn't know what chemical uh, they had on them, didn't know where it would be hazardous to bring it into the hospital, so large decon centers had to be set up at UAC Aiken, which is right across the street from the hospital. Eventually, an evacuation for a one-mile radius was put into place, which meant over 5,000 people had to be removed and housed in different locations. Unified command was put into place as more agencies and aid arrived on the scene. There were over 111 agencies that participated in the response. 
Operations lasted for over 10 days. And as time progressed on, we set up a, a, a command post uh, about a half a mile up the road. Then we got to decide, got to thinking and deciding, are we too close? Do we know what we have? Do we know which way the wind's going? And, and, and uh, there was a flag there at the car dealership that we set up at that you could see the wind was blowing kind of from the direction of where we thought the train derailment was. So we decided we need to move further up the road. So as time went on, we uh, moved to the old uh, Kmart parking lot and started getting hazmat teams in and uh, naturally press started coming in, uh, law enforcement, because we knew we had to uh, basically block off the whole area, not let anyone in. And we had to get hazmat teams to start going in and, and checking and getting people. And we also started receiving reports that there were people in the mills that uh, needed help that uh, couldn't get out, they couldn't breathe. I mean, it's really, it was chaos because you didn't know what you had, you didn't know where it was, you didn't know if you were sending people in, were they gonna end up being fatalities? It was uh, very strange. Um, it, was, it was like one of those um, Stephen King movies. You couldn't hear anything, no dogs barking, no birds chirping, no, random truck driving by. All you could hear was the railroad crossing bells just consistently clanging over and over and nothing else. No wind stirring, nothing. The chlorine gas that leaked out that night in the end claimed nine lives and injured over 500 people. Uh, then we went into the break room and we found another individual who was laying on his back. That one bothered me more than any because I quickly uh, took a uh, carotid pulse and found nothing and then I checked for pupil dilation and when I opened his eyes he had blood in his eyes. The eruption was so quick and, uh, and again the hole so gaping till the, the liquid is, uh, the vapors escaped so fast to it, it was uh, it pushed back against the wind flow some and just fortunate that it was blowing in a direction that laid it right on the creek bottom here to what we call the horse creek it just kind of followed that horse creek right along that, that bottom down there, uh, which is not populated. Uh, it's a pretty much a wooded area, except for the plants that are located along the horse creek. Although the horse creek area is not heavily populated, the chlorine gas did affect much of the vegetation, bleaching and killing it, as well as some of the animals and the fish in the area. I mean, if, if you can imagine anything could happen, it happened within those 10 days. Another problem was that the Graniteville main fire station was only a few hundred yards away from the accident scene, putting it right in the path of the gas cloud and causing most of their firefighting equipment to be unusable. We lost our headquarters station, everything within it, but thank God we had two other stations. We could still survive and be in business, but we lost the heart of our operation. The steam plant boilers were another concern and they had to be shut down for fear of possible explosions. Well, immediately after the derailment, within the next three hours, uh, the textile industry had a large steam plant, had large boilers that were running. It was determined that, that those boilers had to be shut down. If not, then we were going to have an explosion. So we sent a crew in to, to uh, shut down the boilers. We had one fellow on the fire department that was familiar, matter of fact, had worked at the steam plant, so he knew how to shut down the the boiler system, and then they, did, uh, they detected there was a fire within the steam plant. Uh, the boilers were coal fed and there's a silo and a coal chute, and it was fire up in the coal chute. They managed to get one of the fire trucks out from the station in the hot zone, and then they set it up at the plant to monitor and douse the fire in the coal chutes. Chlorine is a poisonous gas, and it's regulated as a corrosive and, and a poisonous gas by the Department of Transportation. And the thing about chlorine is that it's transported in liquid form, but it has an expansion ratio of 450 to 1. So when the tanker ruptured and this liquid was released, it expanded into a huge volume. And the toxicity of it is very high. There were 16 cars that derailed, and five contained hazardous materials. The hazardous materials included three tank cars of chlorine, one tank car of sodium hydroxide, and one empty car containing the residue of elevated temperature rosin. One of the chlorine tank cars was severely breached, 
and several attempts were made to reseal the leaking car. None of them were entirely successful, but more importantly, most of the chlorine gas had leaked out very shortly after the tank was punctured. But the railroad got uh, cleanup companies in, they got HEPACO in that uh, unloaded. Uh, they, I think they went through a process of converting the left chlorine in the car. There was, it was 90 tons of chlorine and uh, I'd say roughly 160,000 160, pounds. 90 tons roughly escaped into the atmosphere, but there was some liquid left and they had converted it from, uh, from uh, chlorine to Clorox. There was another car there that derailed, which was sodium hydroxide, and I think they used this in the conversion process to convert it to pump it off. A little over a month after the incident, there were still many concerns and health issues and trauma for the people of Graniteville. So a group of citizens came together and formed the Graniteville Community Coalition, along with the South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control, to address many of these issues. When the emergency response was going on for two weeks, you had all these agencies, all these people helping. After the emergency response, people just, all those folks disappeared. And here were people still trying to cope, going back into their homes, had a lot of fear, a lot of uh, stress, and just wanted some help with that. So we agreed to do four community meetings, and we did all of those in March of that year. And what we found during those meetings it was people were very concerned that there was still a lot of contamination. Didn't really have a good understanding about the chemistry and what happens after the release and with chlorine gas. Some people are still free. Some people want to move on. Some people want to forget about it. You just never can forget about what's happened in your past. The chemical gas that leaked out that night not only claimed nine lives and injured over 500, but also destroyed all the plants in Graniteville, putting a definite end to the industrial era in the area. Of course, when you lose industry, I mean, you, you're talking to probably 3,000 people losing jobs. What can you do? One of the things we learned was that the training that we had and the relationships we have with the uh, departments around us, uh, we work well together. And it was a huge, Hazardous Materials Institute, the largest one in the United States in over 30 years. What we have learned, the best way to prevent this from ever happening again is to uh, tighten your regulations on uh, chemical transportation, uh, try to come up with ways like this to prevent this from happening. So you've got areas on the railroad that's what they call a dark area. There's no automatic switches, all manual pull. And you know, when something's manual, human error can happen. But electronic errors can happen also. Uh, we did have um, you know, immediate um, requests for shelter in place by the incident commander. Unfortunately, it was delayed by almost three hours uh, before the people knew uh, and got the word. Uh, the uh, reverse 911 system that Aiken County has is, is unique, not many counties in South Carolina have that system, but uh, we didn't effectively use it. Uh, I think we've learned a lot from that. The next time it'll be faster and they'll have more information. The Graniteville train derailment is not unique in any way. Every day through North America and all around the world, trains pass through similar villages, towns, and cities carrying equally deadly substances. As long as these materials are being transported, as safe as they say these tank cars are, nothing's for sure. I think they need to, to make sure that the, the hazardous materials is treated almost like nuclear, where they know where it is and no one gets close to it, and, and they take it along a route that has the least impact on people. And coming through the center of the town was not the least impact.